Okay, well, thank you for joining today's nonprofit education series from BPM. My name is Daniel Figueredo. I am BPM's co-leader of our nonprofit industry group, and it's my pleasure to have our presenters here today to discuss international taxes. You can change the world, but you can't change international tax law. Uh, it's a bit of a, a, a funny title, but uh, also describes a bit of the, the seriousness of, of what comes with um, some of the activity that's going on with uh, other countries right now and, and how aggressive they are being uh, towards entities around the world, including, including the US and including uh, nonprofit entities. So let's go ahead and uh, introduce our speakers for today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sven Joost and, and Javier Salinas. Uh, Sven and Javier are two of my colleagues that I rely on heavily, especially for my nonprofit clients that have activities abroad. Uh, they are very helpful when it comes to uh, entities, uh, intercompany arrangements, uh, organizations that are operating in foreign jurisdictions, even if they just have one or two people or events abroad. Sven leads our transfer pricing group uh, that focuses on intercompany arrangements and transfer pricing studies. He comes with Fortune 500 experience, uh, being in charge of transfer pricing at, at a Fortune 500 company and, and has been at this for quite a while. Javier is uh, my international tax colleague. He helps our clients uh, address their international tax footprints and potential exposures. Javier has some great experience from uh, national offices of Big Four. He's worked for the IRS and US tax courts as well. Uh, so it's my pleasure to have both Javier and Sven. Thank you for the introduction and hello everyone. So why is this important uh, for a tax exempt organization? Well. The primary consideration is that the tax exempt status you have in the US doesn't necessarily carry over to how other countries and the local tax authorities in those countries might view things. In other words, tax exempt status in the US is not gonna be necessarily recognized in foreign countries without following specific local rules to either pursue obtaining local tax exemption or other type of recognition. So the international tax rules that we look at for for-profit companies, uh, they apply equally to nonprofits that may be conducting activities outside the US. So that's why it's important to keep in mind when you're looking at any type of activity outside the US, think about what that activity is specifically and to at least uh, understand what are the specific considerations that you might look to to say, okay, what's the implications for us as an organization? Is there compliance obligations in the local country? Is there registration requirements? Is there an income tax or VAT tax for indirect taxes that uh, needs to be reported or paid? So this presentation on the international tax piece will go into some of the activities that most commonly come up in um, tax exempt organizations and their, in their activities pursuing their, their respective missions and what considerations on the tax side are important to keep in mind as you consider operations outside the US. Okay, so turning to the international tax questions. Uh, next slide, please. We'll start with some of the different general activities that US organizations may be considering or conducting outside the US and just uh, kind of frame those in the context of what um, likely activities may take place and then start thinking about, okay, what are the respective tax considerations that at least need to be planned for or addressed to help manage those potential exposures? So one question is, for activities outside the US, is it going to be a specific isolated event or is there a need for an ongoing presence in the foreign country? For example, it, there may be the need or the interest in hosting a one-time conference in a foreign country. So that would um, implicate certain considerations, but maybe not warrant setting up a foreign legal entity if that activity is going to be a one-time event just to avoid the um, the expense, financial expense, and then the local reporting and all the other, other registrations that may be required. Um, is there an opportunity for some type of affiliation with a third party organization in the local country? 
Uh, so what that arrangement might look like. Is it structured in terms of a joint venture? Does that create a partnership with the third party organization in the foreign country? And so all of those gating questions help, under, help us understand and help the organization manage what are the potential exposures from a tax perspective and what are the relevant reporting requirements depending on what activities are taking place. Is there the need to have a local office established for the U.S. organization? Um, again, that leans towards more um, ongoing activities where a local office may be required either to provide local support for members in the particular geography or other, um, other activities that may be soliciting new membership, depending on the type of activities you focus on and whether that creates a so-called branch, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then the other alternative is, well, if the activity is going to be ongoing for a significant period of time, does it make sense to actually incorporate or establish a foreign legal entity? And what does that mean in terms of local tax exposures, reporting requirements, and also what does that mean in terms of compliance or potential tax exposures for U.S. purposes? So some of the questions to ask as you're navigating these potential activities outside the U.S., what are the goals in the foreign jurisdiction? Again, is it going to be a long-term presence or is it more of a short-term activity? And there's different options to help navigate that from a tax perspective, but those are the that's one of the primary questions that you want to be thinking about as you're looking to uh, expand out of the U.S. And, and, and conduct some activities outside. Is the uh, activity going to involve a partner, is it a unilateral independent type of function that might be going on? Um, depending on what the particular activities are, there might be uh, preferable ways of arranging that activity. Is it for educational services, uh, sales or planning or hosting events, um, collection of membership dues and uh, supporting membership needs in the local geography or maybe the distribution of materials. Again, de just depending on the particular functions of the organization and what focus you might have for a particular geography or country outside the US, there, these are the different questions to be asking and each of them might have different tax implications or considerations at least to, to manage. Again, it's always the threshold question when you're looking at different geographic locations or different countries, um, what, what's the plan? What's the goal that for focusing or targeting on a particular geography? Is there a one-time event that may make sense for the organization's um, goals for the fiscal year or for the mission in general that could be um, ongoing for several years? Um, is there an onerous registration process to doing business in the local country? Each country has its own specific rules and requirements. So that's why it's important to understand what the landscape looks like to conduct some initial research to say, okay, if there is uh, not just from the operational sense, what where there's a need or a priority to focus on for your activities, but then what does that mean then for local purposes? Is there a need to uh, officially register with the local authorities to quote unquote do business in that country? Um, so those are the, some of the, the issues that um, are important to ask or address. And also question of, is there a tax treaty that the US has with that local country that will provide certain safeguards at times as to what activity could create a taxable presence, but without a tax treaty in place, um, an organization may be left to the local laws or the local authorities' interpretations of those laws in place as to what's going to create a taxable presence, what might have an income tax or indirect tax, VAT tax liability, when is reporting required, all those questions. We have a, a lot more control or understanding of what those exposures are and how to manage those when there is a tax treaty in place with the foreign country. Okay, well now we'll turn to the concept of a permanent establishment or PE and some residency considerations. Next slide, please. So basically a PE is a fixed place of business which generally rises, gives rise to income or value added tax liability in a particular jurisdiction. 
And this concept of PE, essentially it's, it's a taxable presence. So that's what a lot of the tax rules will um, call or label that type of presence or activity that gives rise to taxable presence. Um, and there are a lot of some practical considerations to think about of, do I have a PE? Does my organization have a PE? Um, so we look to what is the resident status of a company, place of effective business? Um, is there a PE created by an agency relationship the organization may have, for example, um, with the use of contractors to carry out certain services that you need in different countries without necessarily creating a, um, a local entity for the company or the organization or creating more of an ongoing presence, but you need certain support services performed and that agency relationship could create a PE or a taxable presence. Likewise, there may be situations where some of your employees or contractors are working from a home office. And the question then becomes, does that home office, is it attributable to the US organization so that the US organization for tax purposes for determination of whether there's a PE, is that a presence of the US organization in the foreign country? And also cross-border workers can be an issue. Um, you know, for example, if someone may be uh, an employee that say is living in the Pacific Northwest and for um, certain reasons travels to Canada at times to perform services, maybe not services specific to, um, to functions in Canada for the local market, but for let's say personal reasons, there's um, the, the employee or the contractor is based in Canada. Does that create an exposure for the US organization for Canadian tax purposes? And as we may see for some of our organizations now or other contacts with the travel restrictions that, that um, many of us are subject to related to COVID and whether employees or contractors may be um, um, forced to remain in a particular location outside of their normal um, place of, of employment. Does that create potentially a tax exposure for the organization in another country? Um, and you know, this considerations for how to manage that risk and be aware of the potential exposure and, um, and understand when there might be a uh, liability or even a reporting requirement in the different countries. So talking about the resident status of an organization, in the US, the rules are pretty straightforward. It's based on place of incorporation or, or establishment. So we have that kind of bright line test. But when you're looking at activities outside the US, other rules might apply. So there may be um, different interpretations or different applications of the rules to a particular organization. Other countries may look to the place of effective management for the organization to determine, to determine where it's a resident or where key or strategic decisions are made by the organization, uh, by where board meetings may be hosted or where the CEO or other executives um, happen to be present or based and what that means in terms of residency for the organization for tax purposes. Okay, as I mentioned, the important question is, do you have agents in other countries that could create taxable exposures for the US nonprofit? Uh, generally, these issues come up where the agent is not completely independent. They're not uh, acting on their own behalf or providing services to other um, organizations, other customers or clients. Um, does the US organization um, oversee the agent's uh, functions and work? Is there a reporting scheme to where um, that agent looks less and less independent and really is a dependent agent of the organization, which um, really creates a, really a function or presence of the organization in the other country? and that potentially leads to that permanent establishment or taxable presence. Uh, again, a home office is another issue that may create um, tax residency status. Uh, what's the degree of the permanency of that home office? Is, um, is 
no office open by the organization in the foreign country to where the local employee or contractor may need to work out of a home office and what implications that has for the U.S. organization. So turning to the concept of a branch, um, for U.S. purposes, a foreign branch means an integral business operation carried on by a U.S. person outside the U.S. And a U.S. person, it's in the tax terminology, so that would include a nonprofit organization that may not necessarily uh, have or intend to establish a legal entity outside the U.S., but the integral business operation, whatever that may be, you know, I'm talking about, as an example, agency relationships with uh, certain individuals or even other um, entities or organizations, uh, depending on if that function or activity is viewed as an activity effectively performed by the U.S. organization, that could create a branch. And that might have implications for local registrations, uh, tax liabilities, and even uh, foreign reporting for U.S. return purposes. It's a facts and circumstances test to determine whether a branch exists. So unfortunately, we don't have a bright line rule, even under the U.S. tax guidance, to understand do you have a branch or not. It really looks at particular uh, situations to say, okay, maybe uh, there's books and records that are maintained for the activities of a uh, local operation. Um, maybe there's not, maybe it's all treated as just part of the U.S. organization's books and records, but based on the presence of local staff, um, maybe an office space that is rented, um, there's a, a fixed place of business and that could constitute a branch, even though books aren't separately maintained. Um, so again, it's facts and circumstances, but it's important to uh, consider these issues as to what's going to create a branch, a permanent establishment, and effectively, in the way, a taxable presence that will require at least reporting requirements and obligations to be fulfilled, if not having a true tax liability as well. So the PE itself does, doesn't mean that um, the profits of the non-resident are taxable. In other words, uh, if there is activity in the local country by the U.S. organization. Um, that in itself doesn't necessarily mean there will be a tax liability. As I mentioned earlier, it's important to know, is there a tax treaty in place? Maybe the treaty, because each treaty is separately negotiated, each have slightly different terms, but the question there is, does the treaty provide an exemption for certain activity? Or if there is income generated from a, a particular activity, is it considered sourced or subject to tax in the local country? Or does the treaty say, no, it is sourced instead in this instance to the US so that it would generally uh, be within the nonprofit function of the organization and not subject to tax. Um, but again, it it's, depends on the particular treaty. So each country is, may have slightly different rules. And in situations, where there may be a dispute regarding a potential tax exposure in a foreign country, treaties would typically have a mutual agreement procedure. It's the MAP proceeding referenced there by the acronym. And what that means is that the local tax authorities at times can negotiate with the IRS um, regarding disputes under the treaty as to who, if income is, is subject to tax at all, and if so, which country has the taxing authority? So again, if it's the US where there's a dispute um, and the US is the um, country deemed to have taxing authority, then ideally that income would then be considered as um, generated pursuant to the nonprofit organization's purpose and mission for which it has tax exempt status and ultimately not be subject to tax. But without the treaty in place, that MAP proceeding would not be available and um, an organization just may be left to the, uh, the disposition of the local tax authorities. Are they aggressive on these points or not? You know, it depends on the particular agent involved in or the country involved. Okay, now we'll turn to some of the U.S. compliance and reporting obligations for some 
activities that a U.S. organization may be conducting outside the U.S. So I mentioned a Form 926. Again, these are um, some of the primary firm for, uh, forms, definitely not an exhaustive list, but some of the primary ones that come up in practice that um, you should be aware of if you're not already familiar with, just to know that there may be a reporting requirement to understand when this needs to be part of a your U.S. tax return. In Form 926, it covers transfers of property to a foreign corporation. So this could be uh, transfers of cash, for example, to help fund. If you do set up a, a foreign affiliate, um, funding that local entity may be a primary concern. Um, so if it's the U.S. organization that provides that cash contribution for um, initial operations, then depending on your um, interest in the equity stock or, or uh, voting power of the foreign entity, there may be a Form 926 filing requirement. Alternatively, if the amount of cash transferred by the organization in a year's period is more than $100,000, that could also trigger a Form 926 um, filing requirement. And a lot of these, many of the form, foreign reporting forms, firms, I'm sorry, forms carry uh, pretty stern penalties. Uh, for example, this one, the penalty for non-compliance where there's an obligation to attach a form 926 to your US return is 10% of the fair market value of the property at the time of the transfer. Next slide, please. Form 5471, now this form is required for reporting an interest the U.S. organization may have in a foreign corporation. Um, and, you know, again, it's why, why is this important if the U.S. organization has nonprofit status, if this is part of the U.S. return? Well, the IRS wants to collect the information, and depending on the type of income, it may not be um, uh, eligible for tax exempt treatment, uh, depending on what type of income is generated in the foreign corporation. And this, what's, what makes it a, a requisite as part of the U.S. return. Now, the rest of the slide goes into more detail uh, for you on different categories um, on what the form requires. But basically, the important point to take away here is if you have an interest um, or if you have a director role in a foreign corporation that a form 5471 may be required as part of a U.S. return. And the IRS is, is also very strict with this form as well. If there's an obligation to include it with your U.S. return, but it is not, um, there's a $10,000 penalty for each accounting period of, for each foreign corporation for which a filing obligation exists. And at times the IRS can consider the entire U.S. return to be open um, for review or potential audit if a Form 5471 or some of the other foreign reporting forms are not included where there's an obligation to do so. A Form 8261 uh, for passive foreign investment companies. Um, you know, this may come up at times. Uh, a PFIC is a foreign corporation that generally generates only passive type income. That could be um, receiving um, interest or royalties. In other words, um, not um, income that is considered active by reason of being directly related to active business activities, for example, from active sales or, um, um, or educational series organizations. Um, Again, if there is a PFIC, there may be a reporting requirement, but again, it depends on one, testing the foreign entity to see if it is in fact a PFIC based on the um, type of income that foreign corporation earns or the type of assets that that foreign corporation holds to determine if it's a PFIC first. And then is there a reporting requirement for the nonprofit organization? Yeah, there may be, um, an exemption, if, even if there is a PFIC, there may be an exemption from reporting for the U.S. organization. So again, it's just important to understand what are the particular facts of the situation to know what the foreign reporting requirements are. And again, for a delinquent uh, PFIC reporting, this could also include a $10,000 penalty for noncompliance.
You know, we've talked a bit about uh, partnerships. So if there is a foreign partnership, either specifically created or that is uh, de facto created by way of an agreement with a third party organization um, that could create a foreign partnership from a U.S. tax perspective, requiring the form 8865 to be part of U.S. return. Again, uh, likewise with the 5471 covering foreign corporations, um, there are different categories of filers. Each has different reporting requirements as to what information should be included on that form. But again, that's something to manage depending on what the particular facts are and activities and then the um, positions regarding what type of arrangement is established. Okay, just the main thing to mention here, aside from the separate categories and respective reporting requirements, if a foreign partnership is deemed to exist. Um, likewise, with the other forms we've discussed, a $10,000 penalty is imposed for each tax year the form is not filed, if there's an obligation to do so. Another important form, the Form 5713 International Boycott Report. So the IRS requires reporting where there is a situation where a U.S. organization is involved in some type of transaction involving a boycott or embargo. So the U.S. organization, if this, if this situation applies, would be required to report operations in or related to boycotting countries and also the receipt of boycott requests and boycott agreements made. Um, so the filing requirement can also apply if U.S. organizations are 10% or greater shareholders in foreign corporations that have such operations. So if you think, okay, well, uh, us as a U.S. organization, we're not doing these, but if there's an interest uh, by vote or value in the equity of a foreign corporation that you have some affiliation to, and that foreign corporation is the entity that's actually involved in um, transactions with boycotting countries, for example, then that U.S. reporting obligation would apply to you in, this, in that case. Uh, the next bullet point covers the boycotting countries, just so you're aware. The IRS updates this list um, twice a year. The current list includes Iraq, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Emirates, and Yemen. And this has a, a more stringent potential penalty and then some of the other compliance forms we've discussed. And this one can have a fine of $25,000 imprisonment also for no more than one year or both, depending on the circumstances. Next slide, please. Okay, just a brief mention on form 1042. So this is related to withholding taxes that may be required depending on payments that the U.S. organization may make to foreign persons. Those can be uh, foreign individuals, organizations, different types of uh, partnerships, funds, corporations. Any payment by a U.S. organization in general where it's made to a foreign person, that's what should trigger at least the question, is there an obligation to file 1042 and 1042S, which is which reports the specific payment. The 1042 will be the annual return to report these payments to foreign persons that are made uh, from U.S. source. And the 1042S specifies the specific payments maybe to different foreign persons. And it could be salaries paid to um, uh, contractors based in outside the U.S. Um, you know, it's that would generally not be U.S. source because, again, these rules look at where's the activity that creates a U.S. source because the 1042 reporting specifically focus on, focuses on U.S. source income. So if there is interest on some um, loan arrangement possibly paid by the U.S. organization to a foreign entity, then that interest may be subject to U.S. reporting and withholding tax. Um, or is there a royalty paid to a foreign person for some type of licensing arrangement the U.S. organization has. That could create the withholding tax obligation and the reporting requirement. So again, separate from the compliance of reporting the forms, the U.S. organization would, in that case, be considered the withholding agent, the entity that has control over those funds paid to a foreign person. And that's what the rules um, 
impose the obligation on to withhold that tax on the distribution to the foreign person and pay it over to the IRS to be timely and to not avoid potential penalty for failure to pay or failure, failure to file. So quick, Javier, just for context for the audience where we get a lot of questions in that area is in arts and culture. Let's say, example, you're bringing a visiting artist over for a month or so to uh, do performances, et cetera, that may rise um, some of these issues as well as maybe you know, research organizations that might have uh, foreign researchers coming overseas uh, to the US, those sorts of issues. Exactly, great point, Daniel. And that's um, another reason why it's important as one of the getting questions is to say or ask, do we have a treaty in place with the country where, let's say, uh, the example of the foreign performer coming to the U.S., uh, where that person is considered tax resident? Of course, there are some initial questions to uh, do, perform the due diligence to find out this information about okay, what are the specific uh, circumstances. Um, the form W8BEN is the form the IRS has in place that the U.S. organization should provide to a foreign performer or any foreign um, service provider. And uh, that helps the organization be compliant with what the IRS would look for uh, to determine if, if the organization is compliant with its reporting and withholding tax obligations. The treaty may provide certain exemptions from does a one-time performance actually create a taxable presence or does it affect the sourcing of that income? As I mentioned, 1042 focuses on U.S. source, but for um, someone that comes for a single performance, does the treaty resource that income generated from that performance to where it's not subject to U.S. tax and withholding? So again, all these important questions to really dig into to understand, is there a exposure or in fact, a liability for the U.S. organization. So the uh, next form to reference here is the Form 8858. And this is important because it covers reporting for foreign branches. So as we talked about earlier, where we go through the analysis, really dig into what activity is being conducted by the U.S. organization in another country. Does it create a taxable presence by way of rising to the level of a branch existence? If so, starting with the 2018 fiscal year, the IRS added the requirement to file the 8858 where you have a foreign branch. So prior to 2018, Form 8858 was only required where you've got a legal entity that is treated as a flow-through entity for U.S. tax purposes. But again, for additional reporting requirements that the IRS has become more, um, more assertive on. Now foreign branches have this requirement as well, starting with the 2018 tax year and beyond. So again, when, once you have determined that you have a foreign branch in a local country, um, it's important to make sure this form is included with your U.S. return to avoid any um, potential penalties for non-compliance. Okay, quick reference about the Foreign Bank Account and Financial Account Report, or FBAR. So this is any U.S. organization that either has signature authority or uh, control over the funds in foreign accounts. And if and collectively, if, depending on the number of accounts, if it could be in a single account of over $10,000 or that $10,000 threshold could be met in a number of accounts that the U.S. person has either, again, signature authority or control over the funds for then the FBAR could be required or would be required as part of the U.S. filings. And this doesn't necessarily have to be limited to bank accounts. It could be brokerage or security accounts, um, insurance or annuity policies with cash value, or shares in certain mutual funds. So important to keep in mind. Okay, the last topic we'll cover on the tax side are the indirect taxes or value-added taxes. So what is VAT? VAT stands for, as I mentioned, value-added tax and is a tax on the supply of goods and services. So many countries will reference the, uh, the, the concept for indirect taxes as VAT. Other countries you may have seen use GST or goods and services tax, but it's all 
addressing the same type of tax. It's an indirect tax on the supply of goods and services. So very separate regime and set of rules than the income tax rules the U.S. and other countries have. So why is this important? Um, it's important because if the U.S. organization um, may be charged VAT on certain purchases of, of goods or services, then um, what's, is that going to lead to a true expense that cannot be recouped for the U.S. organization? Or if the U.S. organization has an obligation to um, collect VAT on goods and services provided to a third party, um, there may be that also the liability in addition to collect to pay over to the local tax authorities. So the taxable person is liable for the VAT generally for the goods and services supplied in the course of business in that country. So um, again, generally, if, if there is a supply of goods and services from the U.S. to um, a person in a foreign country, then again, generally speaking, there may not be no VAT liability, but let's say there is a need to have um, certain people, employees or other representatives in the local country for a number of days or weeks to help plan and organize an event. And as part of those activities, there may be um, the need to rent venue space or to um, sell certain tickets for the registrations. Um, all of those may have VAT implications just by way of being present for this temporary time period. And if the U.S. organization hasn't registered for VAT with the local country, or if there is no foreign affiliate that is registered for VAT, then that could be an expense that would not be able to be offset either by the um, VAT collected or the VAT paid, depending on the circumstances. So an important issue to, to keep in mind as, as you're operating outside the U.S. Okay, this we've um, covered this. It's just when you must register for VAT. Again, the thresholds vary by country, um, but it's important to keep in mind as the threshold question. What, what, uh, what activities are you conducting in the local markets and whatever um, payment for goods and services may exist that likely has a VAT implication? So it's important to be aware of that ideally before those activities take place so that any registrations can be made if need be, or at least structured from the uh, goods, or service, goods or services provided in a way so that the organization would not be subject to a VAT liability. Fantastic. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be on here. And um, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, um, or getting ready for this presentation, uh, Daniel and uh, Javier asked me, so how much time uh, do you think you're going to need for this topic? And I said, well, I'll just take whatever there's left, right? And, and so here we are. Uh, um, I'll, I'll take what I got left for this topic. So let's move straight into you, uh, the topic here of transfer pricing. And w why is this even relevant here for um, non-for-profit or tax-exempt organizations? And, and where do these concepts matter? And, and what does it really mean? And I, I'll try to target here the audience that are you know, maybe not so much familiar, even new to, to really this topic. And, and really where it's coming from it's uh, from this this concept or principles that, that you may be familiar with of private endearment and private benefit, where it, it basically states that any tax exempt organization, right? Um, and I'm just reading here from the slide, must be organized and operated so that no part of their earnings um, accrue to the benefit of any private shareholder or individual. And this is where sort of then this topic of economic reasonableness is introduced, right? And moving even further of economic reasonableness, meaning how are we interacting within our organization, right? Then leads us to, well, we got to make sure that when we do interact with related parties, as it's more so known in the transfer pricing world, right? We got to make sure that these dealings happen at arm's length. And if it's not, that's when we can cause uh, quite significant issues on on the status and the tax exempt status that we have been that we may have been able uh, to be uh, to have obtained here 
um, for U.S. tax purposes. So, so moving on and, and taking a step back, and I know the next slide is going to already focus on all oh, what's the tax authority's point of view and what's maybe our organization's point of view. What does transfer pricing really mean? In essence, where it goes back to is that we would want, and the expectation is that we deal with related parties. For example, um, your, your tax exempt organization, parent entity in the US, and your maybe European affiliate that may have not a tax exempt status. It is the expectation that you're dealing with each other as if you were unrelated. And, and that's this arm's length principle, right? Um, that that uh, the, the transfer pricing regulations oftentimes refer to. Um, in a domestic context, transfer pricing is relevant. If, for example, you have a tax exempt parent company in the US and you have outsourced, I should say, a portion of your activity that is still to the benefit of the whole organization, but for various reasons may not be allowed to be performed under a tax exempt umbrella into a for-profit subsidiary. And because there is one party that is tax exempt and does not pay any tax, and one is either that is within the US or cross-border, there is, you know, this, you know, general notion by tax authorities that there could be an arbitrary allocation of income, meaning towards the taxing jurisdiction that has maybe a more favorable tax rate, right? And if you're a tax exempt organization, from a taxing authority's point of view, that, that means that there's a tax haven somewhere, right? You don't have to be the Google uh, or the Apples that, that may be operating in some funny jurisdictions with no tax rates, but the whole concept and where the sort of burden of proof is coming in for your organization is if, for example, your, your Dutch affiliate or uh, you know, your small little sales and marketing operation somewhere in Asia, um, or quite frankly, uh, maybe even that one person on the ground that may constitute a permanent establishment, as, as Javier has, has mentioned before, the tax arbitrage kind of thing that drives multinationals, right, is is sort of this this notion that hey, you could be shifting profits. And quite frankly, um, I I have not in the days that I've been doing this, I haven't seen any, uh, to be quite frank, uh, nonprofit organization aggressively shifting profits from one jurisdiction or juris uh, taxing jurisdiction to another. It's more that the burden of proof is on the side of the organization to make sure that we follow the guidance and make sure that um, we have the right documentation in place um, where we can show it's like, look, we, we're doing everything um, around our taxable presence here that follows the general transfer pricing principle. And so let's move maybe on here uh, to the next slide. Um, and, and this sort of goes into why is it important and, and, and why does it really matter? Well, I, I think it all comes down to that taxing authorities around the world and quite frankly, here in the US too, want their quote unquote fair share of, of revenues. And I think that's going to be even more relevant with the, the current environment of economic uncertainty and the, this pandemic that we're in. Everybody, every jurisdiction will be, will be struggling to collect the revenues uh, to pay for all the various programs and, and, that, that, and relief packages that have been, have been published. And so the dispute can come from, and I'll use this example here um, as let's assume for now, we, we have our organization, tax exempt organization here in the US and we have maybe a sales and marketing uh, sort of um, operation in Europe somewhere. And maybe let's we'll switch over to the other slide so we can talk about numbers here a little bit. Um, and all this European arm is really doing is it, you know, it promotes whatever services uh, to the members in the US that, uh, that that we have in Europe, right? So we have maybe a, a base of, of 
of customers in Europe. We have a small little office there. Maybe we have a couple of people on the ground that help us really get some, get whatever that is, trade shows, membership services, or, you know, even our, our internet-based sort of product, quote-unquote, sold uh, to, to Europe, uh, European customers. And so from that point of view, on a, if you put these entities all together, right, these related parties and consolidated transfer pricing doesn't really matter because it's just right pocket, left, left pocket. But what it affects is sort of that taxable income line. And, you know, that may very well be zero in the U.S. because we have tax exempt status. But it does matter because if, let's say, we're in Germany, we're paying 30% tax on um, whatever income it is that we're allocating to our to your our our uh, European sales office. And so, if we look at the the next slide and the and a few numbers here, um, let's just look, for example, here at the case that. Um, we call them here cost of goods sold, right? That could be for a service, that could be for anything, right? From a U.S. point of view, uh, your transfer price is sort of the plug into sales, right? So if we're looking at Germany and let's say we're collecting $100,000 in, in, in membership fees uh, in, in Germany from our European customers, right? We incur costs of, of 10000 here, um, just for the marketing of that, maybe it's it's a, you know it could be could be any number here. Um, on the U.S. side, we have costs that produce these products, right? No matter if they're tangibles or intangibles, or um, and we have some operating expenses. You'll you'll see from a consolidated point of view, we have a hundred thousand income, fifty thousand of cost of goods sold. We got. Therefore, gross profit of 50000 and after operating expenses, we have operating income, or let's assume for now that's taxable income of 30000 And the question really is, where should those 30000 be taxed, right? Um, you could make this example similarly if the U.S. had a for-profit subsidiary here in, in the U.S. that were to be doing certain activities that the non-for-profit organization uh, isn't doing. The question again is where does the 30,000, where should it be taxed? And depending on how you set your transfer pricing, right, um, that 30,000 could be all profit in the U.S., quote unquote profit, right? Um, no taxes on that, right? And, and, and Germany would just be looking at it and say, well, that's interesting. Why should we tax the 30,000? And that's where, you know, transfer pricing has relatively prescriptive rules in that it says, well, you should be dealing with each other, as I mentioned before, as, as if we were all uh, unrelated parties. But um, obviously, there is always a little bit of wiggle room. There is also always this uh, certain concepts that we would be following, such as that we put our sort of binder together, which includes from a legal perspective, an intercompany agreement, and on the more operational side of things, a, a transfer pricing analysis, right, that really uh, analyzes, okay, what do both parties do and what should be the allocation of income or losses for that sake um, that should be realized by both parties such that we can ultimately tax what is right to be taxed in, in the relevant jurisdiction, jurisdiction. Very simple. One minute here on this slide, what do we do? What do I do? I think I do anything or we on the transfer pricing side of things, anything from making sure that you set up your transfer pricing strategy in a tax effective yet supportable way, making sure that your annual compliance and documentation is fine, as well as as needed, engage in controversy cases and, and the defense of, of your system. Ben, just one, one last pre-question that we got for you. I know a lot of people try to write internal memos on transfer pricing and the like. What's the distinction between a study and, say, an internal memo that, that when it comes to supporting it upon IRS audit? Um, I would always say that doing something is better than nothing. Um, that is the, the sort of short answer to this. The longer answer is, your internal memo is likely not going to pass the threshold of um, 
proper or formal documentation as the IRS would expect it, right? And um, that is where, you know, where do you want to put your your money, I guess, and your, your fees for outside advisors? Um, I would say, let's take a look at it. Let's see how we can get to, you know, reasonableness, right? And, and uh, sort of burden of proof. But um, it's a fine line. I think it's, in, in general, I would say, again, uh, something is better than nothing. But um, we do want to make sure that there is enough information in there and that there's a, a, a solid foundation for the analysis that it, it cannot be just torn apart right away.